This book is called The Dynamics of Persuasion and it was actually one of the first books I ever bought when I started studying communication and psychology quite a long time ago. It's written by a man called Richard Perloff who's a professor of psychology, communication and political science and it was first published almost 30 years ago. But I think even 30 years on it's still a book that's worth studying and in this video I'm going to explain why. Okay, so The Dynamics of Persuasion. Why do I think this is a good book? Well, for a start, it's kind of proven. You know, people all around the world have used this on courses. Uh, I guess there'd be lots of practitioners uh, who have probably read it or at least read bits of it. It's been around for nearly three decades. Um, it's in the, I should say actually, in admission, it's in the seventh edition now. I only have a copy of, you'll see, the sixth edition, but there's actually a seventh edition. So it's been around for a long time. It's kind of uh, tried and tested. Uh, it's also a pretty thick book. It's about 600 pages. It's also quite expensive because it's, it's certainly not one of the cheaper books that I'm going to refer to uh, refer to in these videos. Um, so um, yeah, it will set you back a, a few quid, um, but there's a lot to it. Uh, some core principles that you can probably use uh, whether you're designing marketing campaigns, whether you're going to be um, writing about marketing campaigns because you're studying them maybe, or whether you're just a consumer interested to know what marketers do. It's going to be useful to you. Now it's really... Um, uh, split into three main sections um, and I have to say although I've got an older copy here it's um, broadly I've had several copies I think I probably had a third edition first and um, the, the theories that are covered the principles that are covered are broadly the same uh, the difference is sort of the context and the examples maybe that are referred to um, the three main sections uh, that I'm going to talk about are uh, beginning um, which is all about the persuasion um, history uh, how other how organisations have used persuasion, um, a bit about ethics as well, uh, then a section on attitudes and then finally a section on how to use persuasive techniques to influence people's attitudes. There's actually a fourth section which is all about context in this book, uh, for example it talks about health communication but that's quite specific so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really focus on the attitudes um, and the ways of influencing attitudes uh, because they're the things that really stick in my mind. They're, the, they're my main um, uses of this book. So the first section, uh, which I think is worth going back to, and I often do go back to it actually when I'm explaining these things, is all about what are attitudes, values and beliefs? What are the differences between these things? Now you may never have considered that there are differences between these previously, um, but it's important to understand that, that there are. So there's a definition of attitudes, uh, which are learned global evaluations of an object. Uh, there's a bit more detail to it, but you can read that. Um, there's also then uh, definitions of values, which are ideals, guiding principles in one's life, and then beliefs, which are defined as being more specific and cognitive. Now that might sound like gobbledygook to you. Um, I mean, read the chapter, that'll probably help. But then there's also some handy diagrams here to explain how these things all link together. So um, the diagram of values, attitudes and beliefs. Um, and then it's actually on the next page, uh, a very similar diagram, but slightly different, um, showing attitudes and beliefs and evaluations, how they all link together. But by understanding that, it's a fairly fundamental concept. And by understanding that, you can hopefully start to design campaigns that appeal to um, those different aspects of someone's mind and maybe understand how they might be linked together and what you can do to change some of those. There's then a section um, a bit further down. That, that, that was actually chapter three. I'm going to zip on to chapter eight, which is all about people, how different people can be more or less persuasive. So, for example, this um, a, a section about uh, authority and uh, referring to you may have heard of the Milgram experiments and how we respect authority. It also talks about credibility and it also talks about attractiveness, particularly social attractiveness. And that might be helpful when you're thinking about who's going to represent your brand. Is it going to be somebody from your organisation? Is it going to be a celebrity, an influencer, a spokesperson? Understanding the persuasive power of those different sorts of people will help you to identify someone to deliver the message. There's then a section all about uh, the messaging itself. So there's a section in this uh, edition, it's uh, uh, chapter nine, about the fundamentals of the message. And it talks about things like framing, which I've mentioned before in a different video. Uh, it talks about uh, things like uh, two-sided messaging being more persuasive than one-sided messaging, i.e. 
it's not necessarily a bad thing to mention your competitors uh, when you're designing a message, which might sound crazy, but you know, there's science to it. And there's a bit about emotion in there as well. So that's really useful. So we've talked about attitudes, we've talked about who's going to deliver the message, and we've talked about the construction of the message itself. And then finally, there's a section uh, in here which isn't the only book to cover this by any means, but a whole section about cognitive dissonance. Now, if you haven't come across cognitive dissonance before, um, it's um, you know, a theory that's cited um, very widely. And broadly, it means that we don't like conflict in our minds. We don't like to have com conflicting thoughts in our mind. So, for example, marketers may deliberately pose questions to a consumer, um, knowing that it's going to cause a conflict in their mind and they're going to have to resolve it somehow. For example, if you're trying to get people to act in a more environmentally friendly way, you might talk to them about how do they get to work. And of course, you know, someone like me, I do drive my car, I'll admit to that. And uh, I do like to protect the environment. I'd like to be able to get to work without polluting the environment. But at the same time, I have to get to work on time and the car is the best way of doing that. So I ha that causes, if you were to ask me about how I travel to work, that would cause me probably some conflict in my mind, which I'd want to try and resolve somehow. Maybe I'm gonna get a greener car, maybe I'm gonna travel in a different way, maybe travel less, I don't know. Uh, but by posing those questions, you can uh, force people to consider an alternative um, that they maybe hadn't considered before. That's all cognitive dissonance. And you can read about that in chapter 11 in this edition. So it's a useful book, covers lots of different theories. I've, I've skimmed over the top, just picked out a few bits that are valuable to me. Um, I'm sure you'll find plenty that's valuable to you. Um, and you can decide whether the, the money is uh, worth it or not. Um, but I would certainly recommend dipping into it if, if you can do that, uh, because there are some really core fundamental concepts which you can certainly apply whether you're a, a student or a practitioner. I hope you enjoy this video. I hope you enjoy um, my channel. You can subscribe obviously to the channel if you are enjoying it. Like the video if you're enjoying it. Share it etc etc. You'll also find me on all the social media channels so uh, connect with me. Let me know what you think about these videos. Maybe suggestions for other things I could do. I'm always keen to hear from you so uh, just let me know and I look forward to seeing you next time.